So, so far we've taken a fully uh, sufficient statistic approach uh, to optimal monetary policy. Now I just want to show you, you know, uh, that the dynamic model that we've studied before, the dynamic model of Slack, actually is a divine beverage Vixel model, and therefore it exactly fits, it satisfies all the criterion, uh, all the criteria of the uh, sufficient statistic approach that we've uh, we've done. So it's like a, sp a special case uh, of a divine beverage Vixel uh, model, and so it fits into the analysis. So the optimal monetary policy that we've uh, derived in the sufficient statistic framework applies to this model. And uh, so I want you know to check that so that you know to give you an example of a structural model that fits within that broader uh, divine beverage vixel framework. And of course there are many other models, but this would be one example. And then I'll show you how in that model monetary policy operates and how the recommendation of the optimal monetary uh, uh, optimal monetary formula translate into the model uh, and how we can illustrate them. So, <clears throat> so we, uh, we are going to show an example of a divine Uh, beverage Vixel model. That's our dynamic uh, model of Slack. Okay. So for that, we have to check that you know, all the boxes. We have to check all the boxes. You know, there are three things that have to be verified to be a divine uh, beverage Vixel uh, model. So one, the model has to be divine. That is, that when unemployment is at the efficient level, inflation is on target. Uh, but of course, in the dynamic model of Slack, inflation is exogenous. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about inflation. So, maximizing welfare, uh, you know. By choosing an employment, you're going to maximize welfare. You don't have to worry about inflation as being an, another element of the welfare function because uh, inflation is completely exogenous here. And in particular, if the exogenous level that we set is uh, the Fed target, because for instance, some long run monetary communication um, brought inflation to that level, then you know, then the, the mandate of the Fed just boils down to uh, reaching full employment because inflation is just at its target uh, rega regardless. So inflation is exogenous. So the divine uh, criterion is satisfied. Uh, so uh, because the Fed only needs to uh, reach full employment. Uh, to maximize welfare because inflation doesn't respond to monetary policy like uh, considerations of inflation are not going to affect the welfare calculus. Second, you have to uh, the beverage element. So the model has to have a beverage curve and indeed uh, it does. Uh, Dynamic model uh, as a, a beverage curve, which we obtain by uh, assuming that flows on the, you know, that um, labor flows are balanced, and we know that in fact the unemployment rate in the dynamic model is a function of labor market tightness given by lambda job separation rate divided by lambda plus f of theta, where f of theta is a job finding rate, uh, and so thanks to that you always have some unemployment. Uh, in the model, and so your model is a Bavrigian model. So that is checked also. Uh, and notice that, of course, this Bavrigian curve is 
kind of isomorphic to the aggregate supply curve. Once you take the beverage curve and combine it with the production function, you get your aggregate supply curve. Last condition is that you have to be, uh, we are looking for a model that's a Wigzel model, and that's a model in which nominal interest rate controls uh, the aggregate demand can stabilize the economy. And, and this is exactly correct because the AD curve is uh, determined or governed uh, by the nominal interest rate. So we saw that the expression for uh, an aggregate demand curve yd was uh, delta minus the real interest rate, but the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate plus inflation divided by x prime of zero, which is a marginal utility of wealth at zero. <coughs> we had an exponent epsilon, and then we had one over one plus uh, Sorry, so I just noticed that uh, the notation we had used was uh, sigma prime of zero for the marginal utility of wealth, one plus tau of theta here. That's how uh, the model depends on theta, and then we have epsilon minus one. Yeah, so just so you remember, so this is marginal utility of wealth. Uh, this is the epsilon, the concavity of the utility function. So I think everything is kind of clear. Uh, delta, that's uh, the discount right that's just the shape of the utility okay but the key thing here is that uh, the nominal interest rate actually governs the aggregate demand and so by changing the nominal interest rate can change the aggregate demand and therefore you'll be able to control uh, uh, the state of the economy and so we indeed have a vixalian model so all the all the conditions are satisfied uh, Dynamic model is a divine DBW uh, model, divine beverage of Vixel model, and therefore um, the formula in sufficient statistics applies to the model. Okay, so if you want to, um, let's say you wanted to have a structural model that you could use to simulate our sufficient statistics formula to see a bit what it predicts, all this type of stuff, you could use such a model because it, it falls into, uh, it satisfies all the conditions, so the sufficient statistics formula applies um, applies to the model. And so um, graphically, what does what does the sufficient statistics formula say? Well, it's very easy to represent it actually graphically, the, the kind of um, what the formula uh, implies for monetary policy and how it looks. So uh, let's represent again the solution, uh, the model. Uh, let's use our typical diagram to represent uh, the model and its solution. So we'll have tightness, then we'll have uh, output and we have the capacity. So as usual, I'm going to put the market tightness on the vertical axis, output on the horizontal axis, the capacity AL here. And so we always have, we know that we have the aggregate supply curve that looks like this. And then we have an aggregate demand curve that's going to, oops, an aggregate demand curve that's going to look like this. And we know that aggregate demand curve is controlled by the nominal interest rate. So here, you know, initially, we have this level. <clears throat> this level of tightness, this level of output, and of course we can also read here. Here you can see the idle capacity. In the economy which is proportional to the unemployment rate. Um, so you can read it here. Um, and so <clears throat> the way monetary policy works and the way the kind of welfare works, so here we know that 
We only need to worry about maximizing welfare through unemployment because inflation is fixed. And we know that there is a tightness that maximizes uh, welfare. So we could maybe like represent it here. So this would be theta star. Um, and there is an unemployment rate that maximizing welfare and that unemployment rate is just going to appear here. It's the unemployment rate that corresponds to that tightness. So this would be U star here, <coughs> or something that's proportional to U star. Um, okay, and, and we have um, sufficient statistic formula for this theta star U star. So in particular, if we are in our like really simple model, uh, then this theta star might be uh, one, and this U star, you know, you can also then compute U star as a square root of uv for any u and v that you observe. Um, but it, theta star equal one, that's if you, if we, this is if we're in the very simple framework in which uh, the beverage curve is an hyperbola. Recruiting cost is equal to one, you know, that's the parameter rho. In the, the parameter rho that gives us the amount of labor that have to be dedicated to each vacancy in the model if we set rho to one. Uh, and of course, here in this dynamic model, uh, unemployment is completely wasteful. When people are un unemployed, they are just searching for a new employment, but they don't do anything else. So this matches with our simple uh, framework. But if the beverage curve is an hyperbola, so basically hyperbolic beverage curve. And if we set the recruiting cost rho equal to one, then we know that for instance, theta star is equal to one. Um, so in a case like this, that's where you always want to be. You want to be at theta star equal to one. So, and then on the aggregate supply curve, that means you want to be here. And in fact, out of the aggregate supply curve, we can also uh, find the kind of efficient amount of output which is uh, determined by the efficient amount of unemployment. Okay, and so what should uh, uh, the central bank do if the central bank was uh, in the current situation here? Well, in the current situation, we can see if we are here, you can see that you have too much unemployment, U is bigger than U star. You can see that theta is less than theta star. So here you're in a case in which you have a positive unemployment gap. Your economy is, um, is just too slack. So you're, you're basically in a recession. Um, and so the so Fed funds rate must decrease. And graphically, what you want to do is decrease it all the way until, uh, oops. decrease it all the way until the aggregate demand basically brings a, a tightness to theta star. So this is the aggregate demand when the interest rate is at I star. And then in a case like this, you're able to, uh... so here the Fed has been able to stimulate the economy boost aggregate demand, bring tightness up to theta star, unemployment to U star, and the output to the appropriate level. Um, and our sufficient statistic formula tells us that this, you know, the gap between I and I star is driven by the initial size of the unemployment gap, of course, and uh, the size of the monetary multiplier. Um, but graphically, that's what happens. The Fed just going, so the Fed always try to change the nominal interest rate to control aggregate demand and to try to always keep it at this theta star is equal to one. Um, so that, that's the objective. And, you know, of course, in the real world, it takes time to know exactly where we are. You know, shocks takes time to percolate in the economy. Uh, but uh, so that's why the Fed is not always able to keep the tightness at theta star, but that would be, that would be the idea. Um, and something that's interesting, we can also represent the zero lower bound on this graph. You know, we discussed a little bit what happened at the onset of the Great Recession. There was a big unemployment gap that opened. The Fed didn't have enough ammunition uh, to eliminate that unemployment gap. So the Fed funds rate fell from 5% to zero. But that wasn't enough to eliminate the, uh, to eliminate the unemployment gap. And instead, uh, the zero lower bound became binding. But you can also represent the zero lower bound here. So for instance, let me show you two possibilities. Um, 
So one possibility is that at the zero lower bound, the aggregate demand looks like this. So the zero lower bound, the way to calculate, calculate it is to take the aggregate demand when the nominal interest rate is zero. And so in fact, using our formula, uh, we know the expression for this. Uh, so it's going to be like Y as the ZLB. If you want, the expression is delta interest rate zero, so it's delta plus P divided by sigma prime of zero, epsilon one over one plus tau of theta, epsilon minus one. So this is, you take the aggregate demand, you set the nominal interest rate to zero, you get your aggregate demand at the ZLB. Uh, so this is, so if your aggregate demand at the ZLB is further out than uh, where theta star here. So if the tightness by, that we obtain by setting the nominal interest rate to zero is higher than the efficient tightness, then no problem. Your ZLB in a case like this is not binding. So you can reduce rates, bring the economy and the tightness to theta star without hitting uh, the ZLB. Uh, so in a case like this, we would expect that uh, we thought we would expect that the ZLB would not be binding. So it's a situation where you wouldn't expect that. Now imagine another situation where aggregate demand is more depressed and instead you get something like this. So this is again my aggregate demand when the nominal interest rate is zero, but for different parameter values such that uh, the aggregate demand is, is less strong. So for instance, let's say the marginal utility of wealth is larger. People want to save more. You get a lower aggregate demand like this. Well, in a case like this, you know that the only thing that the Fed can do if we start from our initial situation that we had here with um, too much unemployment, the Fed's going to be able to boost aggregate demand all the way to uh, the ZLB. But because the because the, the tightness is below the efficient tightness at the ZLB, then the ZLB is going to be binding. The best that the Fed can do is to bring tightness to this higher level that we have here, that we can call theta ZLB. But because theta ZLB is less than theta star, uh, we'll just be stuck at the ZLB with too much unemployment. And that's typically what happened during the Great Recession, where the Fed did everything they could brought the economy to the CLB, but aggregate demand was so depressed that that wasn't enough to eliminate the unemployment gap. Uh, so here, the ZLB is binding in a case like this. So that would be like what happened during the Great Recession. Okay, so you can see it's very easy to illustrate what the Fed does in this little diagram. Um, and that's one advantage of our model of Slack 2 is that at the ZLB, nothing is different, right? I mean, you have a different aggregate demand at the ZLB because the nominal interest rate is zero instead of being positive, but all the dynamic properties of the model and all the comparative statics and everything remain exactly the same. So in UK, that models are very different. There is a lot of odd behavior at the ZLB because in, in not, when you're not at the ZLB, you have this Taylor rule that holds. When you're at the ZLB in the new Kenzan model, the Taylor rule doesn't hold because instead, the only, you know, the nominal interest rate is zero. And the fact that you don't have the Taylor rule at the ZLB that leads to all kind of anomalous behavior in the new Keynesian model, things that are very strange and actually don't match what we see in the, in the real world. Uh, and you know, there, there are ways to attenuate these issues and introducing, for instance, wealth in the utility is a way to attenuate these issues in the new Keynesian model. Um, but here in our model of Slack, because we have wealth in the utility, um, plus the matching structure, there are, there are none of these issues at the ZLB. The model is exactly the same. Um, all the properties are exactly the same. So it's very simple to um, analyze ZLB situations.